Spike Mendelson, for those of you who are not from Washington, is operating three restaurants here in town. Any, let's play Trivial Pursuit. Who knows what Spike Mendelson's restaurants are? Bernays. Good, what's that? We the, we the Pizza. One other? Wow, this is really impressive. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything more other than to welcome celebrity chef and terrific Mr. Energy Guy, Spike Mendelson. Spike, where are you? There he is. How's it going? How Good. All right, it's all yours. It's all mine? It's all yours. Nice. The pressure's on. Hello, everyone. How are we guys doing? How are we doing? Good day so far? Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, today we have five very, what are we laughing about already? <laughs> no. Today we have five very exciting young innovators, which I'm very happy. I've been talking to them in the green room this whole time. Uh, they have really interesting things uh, on how to improve food production, uh, feeding the planet in a bigger scale. Uh, so it's going to be very exciting. Uh, our first innovator is going to be Harman Singh Johar. Um, he's the founder of, Wor of World Ento. He's pretty much known as the bug guy. Uh, he's a young student and an entrepreneur, and he's influenced by food insecurity he saw in India, and he's inspired to make a difference. Uh, he founded World Ento at 19 years old, uh, just about two years ago. He's, uh, he's 21 now. And he's also a graduate of the University of Georgia, and he works to integrate edible insects and sustainable options into the American diet. Without any further ado, let's please welcome Harman Singh Johar. What's up, Thank man? You. What's going on? Thank you for that introduction. Of course. Cheers. So that, I'm just gonna did I hit all the notes? <laughs> all of them, yep. Well, hi, I'm Harman Singh Johar, and I'm the founder of World Entomophagy. So we're actually a pretty simple company. All we want is for people to, no, is that working for me? To eat more bugs. There should be a nice picture right there. <laughs> um, so the argument to eat insects is twofold, and we can we can always. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> you can see far away with spaces, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Next. No. Okay. Um, there we go. Hey. <laughs> um, so the argument to eat insects is twofold. Uh, the first comes in the point of their nutrition. Insects, well, certain insects, are incredibly nutritious for humans, some having up to 72% pure protein biomass, as well as 60% uh, fat, and that's a good type of fat, omega-3 fatty acids. They also incorporate some natural carbs into their, um, into their so biomass, which is really great for paleo dieters and get you guys the carbs without having them processed. In comparison, our beef only is about 52% pure protein at the best. But the real seller of why, uh, why we should eat insects is their sustainability. Um, insects have many qualities such as they're not, almost nine times more efficient than beef in converting feed into protein. On top of that, they release m minimal greenhouse gases. Their waste is almost immediately convertible into fertilizer, and you can grow them on top of each other, so land usage isn't an issue. Next. Yeah, okay, lovely. Um, so my company occupies the top of the supply chain. We produce and process insects for safety, and when doing so, we create a safe and reliable supply for chefs, food entrepreneurs, and adventurous eaters. Next. Oh, anyway, so we do this uh, <laughs> in particular um, to support innovation. Edible insects are, is an incredibly new industry, so innovation is key to making us um, a real major player in, in the food world. So my company has developed a uh, cricket flour, which is 60, about two-thirds pure, complete protein. 100 grams of this flour will deliver 45% of your daily value of iron. There are zero trans fats, and it's chock full of omega-3 fatty acids as well. And you can do a lot of crazy stuff with this. For example, make uh, blueberry macaroons. So it's one thing to try and feed someone a, uh, you know, a grasshopper like you guys saw in the first picture. It's a whole other thing to offer a child or a young adult a chocolate chip cookie, you know, blueberry macaroon, or even pancakes. Next, please. Lovely. And I mean, and we're opening up a wide variety of options here. We've got you know, cookies, quiches. We're doing bug sushi with uh, some famous Austin sushi restaurants tomorrow for Halloween, piranha sushi. And we're, we're, we're just trying to open up as much of this potential innovation to other entrepreneurs. Next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we're also working with companies like, uh, like EXO, 
to create bug bars that are going out to mass market. So you should see these guys in Whole Foods before the uh, beginning of next year. And I think we've got one final slide. Next, someone? Ah, here we go. So like I said, we have, we have two, two main goals. The first is our short-term goal, which is to integrate insects into the uh, American culinary culture to reduce our carbon footprint and drive those innovations. Next. And that feeds into our long-term goal, which is to use our revenues to fund R&D for famine relief products. And these famine relief products can be uh, deployed just about anywhere in the world. It can be followed up with powerless cricket reactors being produced by some of our partners to give um, local community leaders and entrepreneurs a chance to grow their own protein sources so we don't have to continuously provide support over time. And, yep, so we are at World Ento, and we're trying to be safe, sustainable, and social. Cheers. Harmon, take a seat with me. Uh, I get this now? Yeah. So Harmon, I got a couple questions for you, man. Lovely. So, I mean, I guess, uh, what, what was your first, you know, like how do you actually, did, I mean, when was the first time you ate a, a bug? And was it by mistake? <laughs> uh, <laughs> pretty it, much. I was pretty lucky. Um, my family traveled through Asia uh, pretty extensively, especially India, where my family is from. And I was just exposed to eating insects there as a young kid. And, I was young enough that it wasn't really weird for me until I grew older and realized that what I was doing was kind of strange from, you know, from an American standpoint. But so this has kind of been happening uh, you know, in different parts of, of the world? For, yeah, roughly 80% of the world eats insects indigenously. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty steadfast part of most cultures. Okay. And what's, it, what's kind of like the long-term outlook on eating crickets? I mean, can we actually convince, I mean, convince all these people to leave here by, and eat a, eat a cricket? Um, I don't know about all of these people, but yes, I mean, we're, we're, we are growing. We, we focus specifically on early childhood education because yeah. the idea, the only reason that we don't eat insects now is, is there is a psychological aspect to sure. it and there's, right. a, there's a social taboo. So if we can get to kids and educate them early on on why it's fantastic for them and their environment, it's not, we, don't, we don't see any issues. Is there anyone in the crowd that's actually eaten a cricket or any type of bug? Yes? Wow. Is there anyone see? who would like to try one after this? <laughs> Who wants to try a bug with me in about five minutes? Yeah, okay, we have a couple of people we're gonna Lovely. get, get perfect, up here in perfect. a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, you know, is this gonna be is this gonna be like a real thing or is it just an, like a novelty at this point? You oh, know? absolutely, it, it's gonna be a, a very real thing. We're already being courted by a lot of investors. Uh, we, our colleagues um, in Canada, just won the Holtz a one million dollar prize from Bill Clinton to pursue a similar project in uh, Mexico. Um, it's 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 fast becoming uh, a future food trend. Sure. It's, it just makes sense from every angle. And it's just so sustainable, we can't ignore it. Right. And what's the scalability? Like how, I mean, first of all, like where, are, where is this cricket farm? Is it in your <laughs> home? Uh, are they running around the place everywhere? Our, like, cricket, our cricket farm partners are in Louisiana. Right. We did start out farming them in my dorm room at the University of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we scaled pretty quickly, and now have a, uh, uh, we, we have a pretty major farm with processing facilities. And um, I mean, you, Really, you can, you can scale this to the moon if you want. Just keep stacking cricket on top of cricket on top of cricket. Okay. You, know, you can't do that with cows. Any scary stories on how like, they all escaped or something like yeah, that? Yeah, we've, we've got more than our fair share. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but the real scary ones, we're, we're, we're beginning to experiment with scorpions, especially Ooh. for our sushi clients. And uh, when those, go, those get out, then, then it's a, a whole different story. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right, we'll save the crickets here. I'm going to taste them after we get everybody out here. Uh, I mean, I, just get, I guess my last question is, I mean, I have a pizzeria, mm -hmm. right? Am I going to be able to like be able to buy cricket flour, make cricket flour Absolutely. pizza? Is that Absolutely. something that would you work? You could do that today. I could do that today. Yes. I mean, we're going to have a slice of pizza and a beer later, my friend. Oh, fantastic! All right, so we have <laughs> we have our next uh, innovator to come out. Um, her name is Diana Gravelis. She's the development and associate at uh, Grameen Foundation. Diana is an international development pro. She grew up in the D.C. metro area and studied at the Boston University. Uh, and the University of Denver. Uh, Denver. Uh, please welcome Diana. Hello, Diana. Hi. How are we doing? Good, how are you? Good. It's a tough act to follow, I think. The bug act is always a tough yeah. act, yes. <laughs> um, so, as Spike just mentioned, I work for Grameen Foundation. 70% um, of the world's 1.7 billion extremely poor live in rural areas where agriculture is the main source of income and employment. 900 million rural people are food insecure. Poor farmers are often net buyers of food. So despite the fact that farmers are often growing and exporting food for the rest of the world, they often cannot feed their own families. 
Grameen Foundation works to address these problems by providing farmers with access to information through mobile-enabled technical assistance and microfinance services. Launched in 2008 in Uganda, Grameen Foundation's Community Knowledge Worker Program works to improve the reach, effectiveness, and efficiency of agriculture extension services delivered to farmers. Grameen Foundation has deployed over 1,100 CKWs in Uganda since 2008, who are providing services to 210,000 smallholder farmers there. We're taking those learnings and adapting them in partnership with like-minded organizations to other countries, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, and Latin America. Through the Community Knowledge Worker model, Grameen Foundation works to provide farmers with a two-way communication channel for adaptable information through a trusted intermediary, the Community Knowledge Worker. So what impact has the CKW model had on lives of farmers? They've reported a 17% increase in knowledge of new techniques, a 22% increase in the prices that they ne can negotiate from traders, and 71% of farmers report that they have acted on the trusted information they were given by their CKW. Traditionally, so many ambitious agricultural development projects have failed, and some donors are feeling a sense of fatigue about problems such as feeding the world. Typically, these have been top-down in design and have focused on hardware, tractors, warehouses, dams, and bridges. From Grameen Foundation's origins in microfinance, we know that it's possible to turn this traditional approach on its head. The process for developing our CKW solutions is very human-centric. We start with the farmers as collaborators, taking input from the farmers at every level to inform what types of solutions um, and access to services they need. This model is based on human capital and trust, which we learned was very important through our work in microfinance. The program is still relatively new, and we view our results so far as very strong indicators, but not definitive proof. We will continue to be in the business of making revolutionary innovations available to rural households in a bottom-up way. And we have a video to illustrate some of the impact of the data that we have generated. Here is a brief overview of a potential disease tracking workflow using Grameen Foundation's Community Knowledge Worker Program data inside the Palantir Gotham Data Fusion platform. We start by drilling down through the million odd search queries to only look at questions related to crops. From there, we drill down further to only look at questions related to maggots attacking crops. Once we've isolated the maggot-related queries, we drag them to the map to plot their geographical distribution in a heat map visualization. Spotting an outbreak requires adding the time dimension to our analysis to understand its direction and scope. By starting with a narrow slice of time and expanding it, we can see the outbreak bloom in a particular district. Once we know the extent of the outbreak, we can drop the queries onto a map and spider out to the farmers and community knowledge workers reporting this outbreak, who then, presumably, could be contacted by officials for more information on stopping this blight. Nice video. Um, all right, Diana, let me, I just got a couple questions for you. I mean, what are some specific examples of uh, how mobile technology is actually uh, making a difference in the development world, world right now? So in terms of agriculture, I think that the real um, proposition that mobile technology can play there is actually connecting farmers past the information services to other services, like financial services, um, and informing also exporters and importers and other players in the ecosystem of what the farmers need. And those organizations have traditionally not created cost-effective models to do that, and that's really the value that kind of mobile agriculture specifically on the information side can play. Okay. Um, and then, you know, what does mobile tech mean for individual farmers, especially those in the past that have a difficult time succeeding? I mean, like all these guys out there that, that you know, are having a rough time, I mean, you know, what is it gonna do for them? You know, I think what it really means is they'll have access to better information. Um, and with that better information, they'll be able to increase their productivity um, and increase their efficiency. And a lot of that is just providing access to the information through a trusted person. Um, and through that trusted person, they could even see, you know, this CKW has adopted these practices themselves, and their plot of land has been a certain percentage more productive. So these techniques obviously work. Um, and I think that that, you know, combining the, the human-centric centric approach with access to information is really going to drive the difference um, for the individual farmers. Well, thank you, Diana. Yeah. Very, very informative. All right, so for our next innovator uh, is Jaden Yosef Yosefi. I hope I pronounced your name right. 
Uh, he's the CEO of Essential Dynamics, maker of the Imagine 3D printer, which can print all kinds of 3D, 3D objects and is only limited by imagination. Uh, the printer uh, has caused a huge stir when it was introduced at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2012. And uh, Jaden is committed to understanding how robotic technologies will enhance human performance in the 21st century. Let's please j welcome Jaden. Is he coming? <laughs> yeah. Hello. So I'm Jaden Yosefzai. I'm the CEO of Essential Dynamics. And the planet has a problem. The problem is that we're 7 billion people going to 9 billion people. And that's an addition, folks, of 2 billion more people. The population of planet Earth in 1940 was about 2 billion people. So effectively, we're saying that we're sailing along in outer space, and another planet Earth comes and says, hey, there's 2 billion more of us, and it's time to feed us. So we've got a grand challenge ahead of us. And that grand challenge can only be met by new technologies. So we're engaged in robotics technology. Imagine Printer works uh, with many materials, including food. And um, we are working with labs and research facilities around the world that are engaged in um, cellular production of food. So what they want to do is they want to make rich, high-density sources of protein that will facilitate uh, uh, meats that are far more nutritionally enhanced and don't leave the type of footprint on the planet that is affecting global climate. So uh, when they are ready, we are working with them to uh, produce a food organizer slash reorganizer. That a food reorganizer would be the metamorphosis of what 3D food printing will become. So I'm here to tell you that 3D food printing uh, is not as much the future as 3D food or organization and reorganization is. I mean, how many of you uh, have gone to the supermarket and have seen tofu? Tofu is delivered to us in a manner that's just a block of material. It's a protein source, but not very appealing. The goal for us as we're uh, metamorphosizing the Imagine machine is um, to deliver a product that is far more viscerally appealing and visually and aesthetically pleasing. So our goal, end result goal, which will be accomplished within this decade, is to deliver a product uh, where you have a, a naturally harvested steak and you have an organically, uh, you have an, uh, a cellularly production uh, steak and one is fraught with uh, red meat dangers and inherent um, uh, dangers of that type of uh, natural harvesting, or you have one that's nutritionally denser and better as a food source for us overall, and you will be uh, unable to distinguish between the two. So that's our goal, and that we are reaching rather quickly as we work with these labs. So that's the future. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Uh, I mean, this is a topic for me that I find uh, very interesting uh, for a couple reasons. I feel like I'm going to be out of business soon. There's going to be like 3D pizzerias you're going to be opening up <laughs> and burger places. Um, no, but you know, when you, when you hear about 3D printing food, like, you know, your imagination could take you so many different places. Um, you know, so to me, my question is, is like, you know, what is exactly, what is exactly happening? What is the process? Can you break it down? in a little bit more simpler terms on w what's actually happening in the process? Right, so existing, existing foods, uh, the material sources being utilized for, especially in food printing, is the act of taking them and putting them through a state to become semi-soluble. Uh, most food products are fibrous in nature, so it's not conducive to yielding the results that you seek, which is why uh, we are working with these uh, cellular production facilities so that at that level, food can be uh, augmented and organized in a manner that's far more appealing because at the end of the day, we want to be able to produce a product that uh, doesn't have the yuck factor and is appealing to us. Okay. 
Um, and I mean, you know, when I think about it, you know, is this scalable? Are you going to be able to make a real difference here by feeding the planet? And if so, I mean, you know, what, how does that look like? Right, so basically uh, you can imagine a world where um, you have um, meat sources such as those protein, high density protein sources being delivered to the developing world and those would be uh, delivered in large vats and we would reconstruct and reorganize those protein sources into far more palatable chicken and steak products and something that would be indistinguishable. Okay. And I mean, is, is it true there's a little rumor between the, the two of you guys over here working a little together, 3D cricket flour? Is this true? We may have had a conversation between you about it. Okay. <laughs> but we still will want to eliminate the yuck factor from the equation. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so now we have a, a very special guest that we're very excited to have. Um, the Planet Forward Project sent a team of two students and a professor to Africa this summer to uncover stories on how technology transforming agri is transforming agriculture. Uh, in Kenya, they met with a brilliant environmental scientist who is working with Kenyans to improve the cost, the impact, and the efficiency of a very important part of eating, the fuel we actually use to cook our food. Uh, let's take a look at what the Planet Forward team discovered. My name is Mary Jenga. And I'm a Kenyan environmental scientist. And uh, I'm working on fuel briquettes so that I can contribute to feeding the planet. In Africa, 400,000 deaths are liquidated per year from indoor air pollution. One of the oldest groups in a Kibera in making fuel briquettes. They've been doing this for several years now. And now what they do is they use charcoal dust, mix it with soil. Okay. Add water. They take the mixture and then they mold it into a solid block. And then they leave it to dry in the sun. The briquette making, it is adapted to the different local situations. You go to the coast and people use coconut husk. You go to the areas where they grow rice and people use rice husks. You go to the areas where people grow sugar and they use sugar candy. This charcoal dust plus soil burns for four hours with so little carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and particulate matter. All right, everyone, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mary Jenga. How's it going, Mary? Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to tell you why I'm so passionate about fuel briquettes. I grew up in a village, and in the village, I helped my mother, my sisters, go to the forest to correct firewood. I am working on an innovation that's addressing a challenge that I lived through. I carried firewood on my back, went several kilometers to the forest. I have been in a kitchen where we used biomass, energy, producing smoke, and I want to be part of the solution on coming up with cooking fuel that is cheaper and that is safer, particularly for women and children, being a woman myself. And uh, as I've been working on this technology, there are certain challenges that I've been facing. I've been working on this since 2007, started it as a small project, and I found the passion of my life. And I scaled up into a PhD, and I did it for my PhD. And I still want to continue with this. And one of the biggest challenges that I'm facing is that there is very low attention on biomass, cooking energy, on the debates of food and nutrition security. 
how do we get and cooking energy into this debate. Imagine a situation in Africa where we've been able to improve crop production, we have food in the stores, but people remain hungry because they cannot cook it. So Jane, um, yeah, I guess one of my questions is, is, is you know, you've, you've been at this for about seven, seven years now, or 10 years, you said, seven? Yeah, seven, seven years. Nine. It's been yeah. a long time. So, I mean, it, I feel like it's, you're, you're constantly innovating, and you're constantly getting better, and things are constantly cha changing. How are, you, how are you applying, like, scientific research that you guys have done over the last seven years uh, to, th to the briquettes? Um, what I've been doing is that uh, working with women groups, especially in the informal settlements, and uh, first and foremost, starting by understanding what they are doing, what is working, what is not working, why is it not working? And uh, my contribution is really to understand if they use different feedstock, for example, different organic residues, and they process it differently, what's the implication of this in the quality of the product that they produce. And then as an environmental scientist, I want to bring the briquette into the bigger debate of environmental sustainability. How does briquette contribute to saving trees? How does it contribute to global warming potential? And because I'm working with the people and for the people, how does it contribute to livelihoods? And therefore my research involves planning designing with the community, being involved with research with them, and looking at the outputs together and testing them. And what, what, are, the, you know, what are the, some of the examples of, of how it's actually impacting people's lives or children's lives, women's lives, on, on, a, you know, on a daily scale? Um, and you know, also, is this, is this somewhat of a business opportunity for, for people in, in, in Kenya? Um, if you look at the film that has been shown, you see that uh, this briquette production uh, mainly are in the very poor neighborhoods. And a briquette has been there for many years. But it wasn't picking up because other types of cooking energy, for example, pure charcoal, kerosene, were affordable. But we are getting into the situations whereby uh, Kerosene is getting expensive, pure charcoal is becoming expensive, and I did some cooking tests with the women, and you find that cooking with briquettes is like 15 times cheaper than cooking with kerosene, and uh, cooking with charcoal, uh, cooking with briquette is like eight times cheaper than cooking with uh, uh, charcoal. And one of the main benefits then is that uh, they are able to save income that they would otherwise spend on cooking. And they use this saved income for other um, f uh, needs in the household. For example, in those very poor neighborhoods where communities cannot afford protein source of food like eggs, meat, milk, once they're able to save this income, then they're able to buy this kind of things. And again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an employment. And in the urban areas, an employment is such a big challenge because almost everything has to be purchased. So the briquette is giving women a purchasing power so that they can be able to access uh, other services. And uh, also, if you look at Bricket, is that uh, women are contributing to producing additional <coughs> cooking energy that is highly required in developing countries. Well, well thank you. Um, yeah, at this moment, I, I'd love to, to hear maybe uh, from, from you guys out there. And uh, I can't really see because of the lights, but is Frank out there? I'll, yeah. I'll the mic. yeah. So if anybody um, has a question, I'll come running to you with a mic. Who would like to ask a question of one of the panelists or Spike? Sure. Tell us who you are and... Good afternoon, my name is Cheryl. Oh, I better turn it on or I'll get in trouble again. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Cheryl Adams, I'm with Bread for the World. And my question is for, I, I don't wanna mess your name up, is it Mary? Mary. Mary. 
what type of financing is available for what you're trying to do? And have you been trying to find out if there's any for what you're doing, which I find very remarkable. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, one thing that is a challenge is the financing bit. Because Chaco Briquette has not really come into the debate on de for development, and therefore looking for funding for it, writing proposals, is, is quite a big challenge. And if only there, were, there was some funding, then we can be able to turn this briquette production into small scale activities for women into some large scale uh, business enterprises because they need space to produce and set up the production units. You saw from the film, they have very little space, and th therefore they can only produce little amount of it, and therefore their selling is low. So uh, they would require to set up this uh, production units, and there is also need for a strong communication strategy. Thank you to, you know, institutions that really look into the issues of communication because we need to communicate this. And then it can get into the rhyme rain and get the funding that it deserves because it's an innovation that is already working. We only need to bring technology and science to scale it up, adapt it to the local situations, improve on it and modify it. Now, if I may, uh, is the team here that went to Africa this summer that shot this? Where are you guys? Over there, Imani Cheers, Sarah Snyder, Gabby's here. So these three, that's, they met you this summer. And I remember what you put at the end of the film, the end of the video, you're looking for $600,000 to do what? To scale it up? Yeah. That's, that's what it would take. If you had $600,000, what would you do? What, could, what would it allow you to do? Uh, if I had that kind of funding, one of the things that I'd like to do is continue developing some science-based evidence. Look at, if you use different uh, uh, organic materials, what quality do you get? And then the second thing I'd like to do is develop some training manuals. Training manuals that are so simple that the communities can be able to train themselves and produce. And this kind of training manuals, I'd like them to be translated into local languages for different parts of, uh, uh, of Africa. And then there is need for a very strong communication package. How can we get this uh, technology into TV programs, entertainment programs, where people can uh, just watch and learn about the briquettes, and the market will be increased, and therefore production will be increased. And I'd like to set up some uh, production units for the community groups, and I'd like them to be community-based, community-managed. And you could do all that with $600,000? Yes. Oh, all right, any volunteers? Any other questions? Who's got another question for our panel, or for one of our innovators? Right here. Would you stand up and tell us? Sure who you are and where you're from. Sure, I'm um, Sarah Glass. I'm from Johns Hopkins University. Um, my question is for um, Harmon about the insects. Um, you talk about- one? Um, well, sure, I'll try anything sure. once, right? You a scorpion? Oh, no, maybe scorpion not. Scorpion sushi? Uh, it could be. I don't cricket know. pizza? Quick, cricket flour pizza, I think, is a good idea. Okay, there you go, Spike. Um, but on not only for um, insects for human consumption, but what about, um, are you thinking about insects for feeding animals and using that as an, um, a source beyond grains that we use? Uh, there could be a lot of, I think, uh, interesting things there. Um, we have investigated using them as feed for animals. Uh, at the moment, simply because the industry is so young, our resources are stretched a little thin, so we actually have been, uh, begun partnering with a few other companies who are specifically looking at feeding, feed for animal. Um, a lot of the insects that we've chosen to use for human production can be used for animal feed, but there are other insects that are more optimal for it. So there's a little bit more research to be done in that field. Um, we have to, there's a lot of work that goes into selecting the insect in terms of you know, sustainability aspects, safety, disease concerns, and so on. So that is being explored, uh, but we are looking for more partners to help us explore it. Anybody else? 
up front, right over here. <coughs> oh, here we go. Hi, my name is Vina. I'm a um, second year MBA student at GW. I've actually heard a lot about um, the Hulp Prize this year and the, you know, the new enterprise with the crickets. I'm just curious to know, um, I know it'll definitely work overseas, but what are some of your thoughts about how you can get Americans to change their views about crickets and eating crickets? Um, the biggest one is, is pretty much education. I mean, like I said, we focus a lot on early childhood education. Uh, really, the, the biggest barrier uh, to date has just been insects don't have never looked really appealing or they haven't been pushed you know that's so we're, we're putting these insects in the hands of chefs specifically to for them to create some of the most amazing dishes you've ever had we had um, mealworm calamari a few months ago in Austin and it was fantastic and uh, you know we're already getting tons and tons of write-ups for a lot of the culinary um, adventures that we're taking in Austin uh, so I think it's just a, a little bit amount of time and making sure that, that the chefs that America is so proud of and just, you know, that every country is proud of have access to these in as ingredients. And that opens up a whole new, you know, world of potential. What, what is the mealworm calamari? Excuse me? What is mealworm calamari? It's, uh, it's they t you took a little bit of squid and then deep fried it using a mealworm coating and then put some strawberry salsa on. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> you know, you get, you, yeah. <laughs> um, Spike. Uh, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I mean, but I have to say those uh, blueberry macaroons look pretty delicious. Yep. You can, uh, any, anything that Betty Crocker can do, we can do with more protein. With more protein. <laughs> we, we, yeah. We're, 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 con we're, considering, we're considering a line of Betty Cricket, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He'll be here all night. <laughs> any other questions for... Uh, is that a, a question? Is that a hand up over there on the side? No? It's like the auction. Be really careful right, who's, what you who, do. Oh, there we go. All the way in the back. Okay. Come on over to the, the side with me. Why not? It's my exercise for the day. Hello. Jonathan Halpern with Designing Sustainability. I was struck in the presentations that what we call technology, actually, there are very different things we're talking about, right? The briquettes is a pretty basic technology, if you will, at this point, while extruding food is a whole other level of technology. So I'd be curious, although each of you are technologists in a sense, I'm curious to get a sense of what other things do you think are necessary in sort of social context, cultural context, policy making, financial incentives that are going to make these technologies, which are quite diverse, plausible? Great question. Do you want to start with the briquettes? Um, one thing about the briquette is that uh, they are being adapted to different local situations. And therefore, when we look at the technology and linking it to socio-cultural issues, we need to look at how are different communities adapting the technology. And then we need to look at the briquette technology and link it to the bigger, for example, bioenergy strategies or policies uh, for the countries. And then uh, we need to look at the briquette also uh, from the way it links to other sectors. For example, briquette has uh, a connection with food and nutrition because cooking food is what made us human. And uh, if we are able to cook food, to what extent do we cook it? So that we can know what types of briquettes, how do we need to look at the quality so it can cook to the efficiency that we need. Then we also need to look at the briquette technology and how it links to water resources, for example. In the poor neighborhoods, they buy water, drinking water, but they also have to buy water for making the briquettes. What technology can come in, for example, in filtering household water so that can be used into briquette? And uh, how does the briquette uh, contribute to the de bigger uh, debates, for example, of climate change? How many trees can it save? What emissions can it save the world? Then with this kind of picture, then we get to get the technology uh, into the ecosystem service perspective. Yeah, Spike, I have, a, I have an email or a, a, a Twitter question from Jenny for you. What's the coolest innovation in food you've seen? 
I mean, I, I have to tell you, when I first heard about this panel, uh, you know, I, I, you know, and after doing some research, I was very, you know, first of all, honored to be here amongst uh, all these young innovators. And I, I, and I think you're sitting here, I'm sitting in front of four of, you know, innovators that I think are doing amazing things. Uh, you know, the gentleman just pointed out how there, you know, there's some that are apply like super technology and some are a little bit more simple. But when you, when you, uh, you know, you kind of dig deep, it, they're so meaningful and they can really change so much um, that I think, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by four of them right now, so. Okay, here's another one. Uh, oh, before I, going before crazy I let you off the hook on that, though, come on. <laughs> I mean, like, you're opening restaurants and you're catering to tastes and you know how people are changing their tastes and what sells and what doesn't. Is there something that you've brought into your cooking or you've brought into your marketing that we're all running out to buy and to see and to taste? Um. You know, like, you know, the restaurants I open are a little bit, I, I mean, you know, I, I have a, the burger place, the pizza joint, and we just opened a French place. And I mean, as far as on how I do business is, uh, you know, I so support locality, uh, you know, our, our, our local purveyors. Uh, you know, I try to resource everything within a, a hundred miles uh, to support the community. Um, you know, I also, you know, for me, like uh, the food that I, we create is all, it's always homemade. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that, that we just buy and put on the plate or, or what have you. So, um, you know, I'm an innovative guy when it comes into food, but I don't think I'm really, uh, you know, anywhere close to where these guys are, are, are taking it. Uh, you know, it's, it's people like this that are going to take it to the next level. I mean, of course, uh, you know, are we going to make a cricket flour pizza? I mean, yes, we are definitely going to make a cricket flour pizza. You know, will I be able to open up 3D burger and sell Good Stuff Eatery? I would love to. I won't, I won't have to hire line cooks or anything like that. We could just print 3D food, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, j all joking aside, I, I, j I just find uh, that, that it's necessary to have young innovators like this, uh, you know, uh, pushing forward and, and, and kind of, you know, finding the new way. Uh, I mean, you heard the hard facts, uh, you know, it's, you know, we're at a 7 billion population and you said it's going to increase in how many years to, to 9 billion? Well, within the next couple of decades. Next couple of decades. Yeah, and, and that means we're going to have to produce food that much faster and that more efficient. I mean, those are scary numbers when you think about it. And, and uh, you know, these are the guys that are going to pave the way to, to figuring all that out. Okay, I have, I have one more uh, a Twitter question from Deepa here for Jane. How long will it take before we actually see the effects of 3D food printing in food insecure countries? Well, I think the uh, food insecure countries will follow a rather quick uh, trajectory as we get uh, roll out the technology so the answer would remain the same within the decade I'd like to take a moment to answer the gentleman's inquiry because uh, we get lost in technology being a new phenomena the technology is uh, part of the human DNA because we actually the first human technology was the flint hand axe and one, once we had that that is when we actually achieved the ability to consume more protein and resulted in uh, what we define as homo sapien, the intelligent human. So that has been uh, innovation. Technology has played an integral role in not only our development, but our continuous uh, going forward. And we should remain cognizant of that as we continue forward and recognize this technology is, has been playing a role in our existence uh, through eternity. Spike, I turn it back. Unless there's another question from the crowd here, I'll turn it back over to you. And you, can you know what I want to do? I want to feed people crickets. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> All right. Who? Who? I need. I, I don't know. How many crickets you got? I've got about twenty, thirty. Uh, before we do it, if you have a shellfish allergy, I have to ask you to please um, not consume them. There haven't been recorded cases of allergy uh, allergic reactions, but I don't want to get sued. Um, yeah, but there. Should we yeah. start with five people that 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 are okay? One, two, three, four. Five. Lovely. All right, we have a. And you can, both of you can come up. Yeah, I just pointed it. Sweet and spicy like, teriyaki cricket for spicy, you guys to try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you, yeah just come on up. And then uh, in the meantime, if there's any other questions that anyone wants to ask at the same time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Jaden, I'm just wondering, how do you actually come up with a chemical profile 
of the food that you're trying to replicate with a 3D printer. My mind is still trying to wrap itself around how you do this and ultimately endeavor to get a product that quacks like the original. So what specifically are you doing to try and you know, isolate the chemical profile and the texture and all these things of any given product and try and replicate it in a printer? Right. So so we're we're don't eat your crickets yet. Wait yeah, a minute. Don't, we, we want to watch. We this. want to watch you eat crickets. Yeah. 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 Don't eat your crickets yet. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, Jen. Jen, mean to interrupt. You can oh, you, uh, you answer first, and they'll just have to. I, I was actually yeah. waiting for their response. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know also. <laughs> Do you want to answer the question first? Sure. Or do you want to uh, watch them eat crickets. First? <laughs> <laughs> so we work with uh, uh, companies, uh, research facilities around the world that are actually engaged in cellular per, uh, reproduction. So they, they're going down to the genomics level. So they're, they're reconstructing uh, the, the very fibers and the muscular tissues of, uh, of the meats uh, or the protein sources at question. So I think it, um, it, uh, it goes beyond just taking existing foods and reorganizing their chemical components and going down to the cellular level. Yeah. Cheers. 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 <laughs> How'd you like it? Great. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> So do we, do, we to, do we get to hear a little of the response? I want to yeah. hear what you, you know, tell little, us what it tasted like and does it go crunchy? crunchy? Is something jumping around inside you right now? <laughs> I want to make like cricket chocolate bars, I feel like now. Or you can sprinkle it on a salad maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Like, like, let, me, let me write these down real quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming up and tasting the crickets. Cheers. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, You know, unless there's any other questions, I, I'd love to hear again from uh, you know each one of our panelists on um, you know these young innovators. They have these great great ideas. How maybe you know other people can help, or where they can come get some more information about each one of your your programs and what you're doing. Uh, you know, for instance, you know how can they donate money if there's anybody out there that that's interested in uh, in you know funding. So I guess we could just start with you. Um, so there's two aspects. The first is if you are interested in working with edible insects or just you know getting involved in the community, perhaps you have an idea for a product. Uh, is that salad girl gone to? Yeah. Um, <laughs> please contact us, you know, worldento.com or worldento at gmail.com. We we love working with you know young entrepreneurs and we support a lot of startups. And then on the other end, if you have an idea on how to solve some of these issues, take the initiative and start. Especially if you're young, there's not going to be a better time than now. So if you have an idea. Try and get involved. There is a community of future food entrepreneurs. You, know, you, can, you see us here now. Where you know, I, I feel we're pretty friendly people. So I mean, just shoot an email. We we will definitely respond, and, and we can get you involved and, and find a way for you to contribute. There is no one solution. We all have to be working together and attacking it from multiple angles. Um, you should definitely check our website. We just went through a rebrand and it looks excellent. So everybody go check that out. Um, but we also have a program called Bankers Without Borders that is not specific to finance. Um, and it allows people to volunteer their areas of expertise, um, either you know, from your desk or you can go into the field if you're so inclined and work with organizations that really need you know, that level of expertise and kind of need an outside consultant. So if you're interested in that, find me after this and I'm happy to connect you to the people in our organization who run that. And what was the website again? Just it's GrameenFoundation.org. Okay. So um, robotics technology is upon us and it's going to continue to impact agricultural uh, production in all facets, labor and everything else. And the best way for young people to get involved is to get involved in agricultural robotics if they can because that will help all of us have a more sustainable world and more food secure world. And um, by finding an inefficiency and using technology and robotics to create an efficiency is a path forward that's very fulfilling. Um, what I'd like to say is that uh, I'm based in a research institute. And uh, in case of anyone willing to support uh, this kind of technology, I'm working in, a rab, uh, in the lab at uh, Wild Agroforestry Center trying to develop new varieties that uh, have higher quality. And uh, what I'd like to say to the young people 
is that uh, identify something that you are passionate about and let your passion drive you into achieving the and into contributing to change to changing the world great touch on it. We've been talking about younger people and students and so on. For the older generations, <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you know, you play a part as well. I wouldn't be anywhere without my mentors. So even if it comes down to where you have to find an entrepreneur and, and just give them your advice and life experiences, that makes just the world of difference. We wouldn't be even one-tenth of what we are today without, you know, our key mentors. I mean, every single one has contributed in a major way. So there's, there's always opportunity. All right, well guys, please give a huge round of applause for our four innovators. <laughs>